I wanted to show you a clock that I made a little while ago, which has some unusual features in it. Uh, the most clearly unusual thing about it is it's not six Nixies in a row, it's three rows of two, so hours at the top, minutes in the middle, and seconds at the bottom. You can see them ticking away there nicely. Um, and the shape comes from, of course, the fact that the case itself has this upright format. And the upright uh, format comes from the fact that it's a bottle holder. It's had a bottle, I think, of port in it. I'm not sure. Grappa maybe port, but whatever. Um, and I found it outside a wine shop. Um, and if you're like me, every time that you see a case, you see a potential Nixie clock. Um, and I grabbed it and put the tubes in it. So it's got neon separator uh, indicators there. Another little trick here is the neons themselves are actually pretty small. But if you embed them in hot melt glue, then it makes them seem much brighter and much bigger than they really are. Um, and they say that you can't put backlighting on IN ones, but this one clearly has backlighting. And I'll show you how that's done afterwards. The case has a rather nice lock on the side, uh, a catch, so you can open and close it to get to the internals, which is where all the cool stuff goes on. It's a veritable hot snot festival in here. Um, that comes from the fact that the way that the tubes have to be mounted so we can backlight them. If you see here, the tubes, the end of the tube is there and the case is there and there's a quarter of an inch, sort of, I don't know, five, six millimeters between the tube and the case. And that's so that we can mount the, L the RGB LEDs underneath the tube and pointing up through a piece of the glass of the tube itself. Um, and we put loads and loads of hot melt glue all over it to keep it in place, firstly. And secondly, because the effect of the RGB LED in the glue is that it gives a rather nice diffusion. So it's not just a point of light, it becomes a, a, a gentle glow. Also, the neons are embedded in hot melt glue. Um, there's an LDR there, a light dependent resistor, also glued into place. Um, and a little distribution board for the RGB LEDs down there, stuck right in the corner. The LDR is quite quite nice because it means that the clock auto dims so that it's not bright at night. So if I cover up the LDR, you can see it becomes quite dim. And if I let it go again, there we go, we're back to full brightness. It's not a very bright day today, so it's not working at maximum brightness, but uh, you can see the effect. Another feature of this clock is um, you can see the module there with the blue flashing LED. That's actually a Wi-Fi time provider and configuration module using the ESP8266 and a little level shifter and voltage regulator board. Um, and that's linked into the I2C port of the clock module itself. You can see it there. This is a small module. I've got another one here so you can actually have a look at the, the module itself. Mm, we've got a, an Atmega, an Atmega AVR um, processor there, opto isolators for driving the digits, and a K155 or a 74141 to drive the uh, the numbers. Um, high voltage generator here, um, MOSFET the 7805 voltage regulator, and everything that you need to make a working Nixie clock. So that's that little board in the back there, wired up to the uh, Wi-Fi time provider and hooked up to the rat's nest here, which links to the tubes. So there's a, a main bundle of wires come down uh, through here, goes to this tube, at the back and then from there 
the connections are daisy chained up and down to the other tube. So it forms like a bus for all of the nine digits. And then the anodes themselves are wired back to the individual opto uh, couplers in there. Nice thing about the Wi Fi module is um, it allows us not to have to do very much configuration by switch pumping, um, which is great. So let's go and have a look at what configurations we can do. So let's have a look at the configuration options of the clock via the Wi Fi module. So, first of all, we log into the clock, um, we put in the IP address, which you can see. Um, when you configure it first or you can get from your wireless router and using that we can log into the clock straight away. We come up with a status page so we can see the IP address that we've been assigned, we can see our MAC address, we can see the wireless LAN ID that we're connected to and we can see the time zone that we're working in. And When you do a refresh it pulls the uh, current date and time back from the server and you can see it's 2017 January the 8th at 132723 seconds the uptime of the wireless module is 15 minutes and 33 seconds um, that's because I turned it on just 15 minutes ago um, some various other uh, information last update that means the last time that the module sent the information to the clock so it sends an update to the clock every 60 seconds um, and every time this gets to 60 we should see it go back to zero and start again firmware revision serial number and confirmation that the wireless module has found the i2c interface of the clock module at address 104. So you can configure the time server that you're working in via the menu at the top. You can configure the wireless LAN that you're, that you're working on. And it comes up with a list of all of the wireless LANs which are available. And all you have to do is pick one, put in the password and click set and you'll be connected. But the really interesting stuff is in the configuration of the clock itself. These settings here allow you to do pretty much every configuration that the clock is able to do. I say pretty much because there are some fairly low level configurations which you'll want to do once, maybe. It's not even sure that you'll need to do them um, and you'll never touch them again. So those are settings like um, pulse width modulation, trimming, and uh, anti-ghosting effects, and power management um, settings. You won't ever usually need to alter them after you've set them initially, and when you do the factory reset, the clock does its best at setting those up um, to what it finds as a combination of power supply and tubes uh, that have been attached to the module. So here we can set 12 24 hour mode. So that's the display mode of the clock. So at the moment it's in 24 hour mode and it's showing one o'clock as 13. You can set the leading zero to be blank. That's the hour leading zero. You can turn on and off the scroll back effect. So the scroll back effect is what happens when you go from nine to zero. Did you see it? quickly counted back through all of the numbers until it gets back to zero. Some people don't like that, so you can turn it off. You can suppress the anti-cathode poisoning when dimmed. So when the clock is fully dimmed at night, I find it disturbing if it suddenly springs into bright life to do anti-cathode poisoning because it turns all the tubes on at full power and cycles through all of the digits there. So this option allows you to say when the clock is fully dimmed at night and the tubes aren't being driven hard anyway, then skip the anti-cathode poisoning. You can select the date format, which is European date format or American date format, or you can have year first. And you can set up blanking of the clock as well. So at the moment I've set it to never blank 
but you can set it to blank on weekends or on weekdays. So um, um, weekends is useful if you're, uh, you have a clock in the office, you just set it up to turn off for Saturday and Sunday. And this also extends the tube life. So all of the time that nobody's looking at the clock, um, you can blank them. You can still turn them back on if you want to. You just press the button once and the tubes will come on for the rest of the minute. If you press it twice, it will come on for the rest of the hour. And if you press the button three times when it's in blanking mode, it will come on for four hours. So you can easily override blanking. But it's a great way of extending the life of a tube. If you select a blank on particular hours, um, you can put in the start time and the end time. So blank from, for example, five o'clock in the evening to eight o'clock in the morning for a clock that's at work or the opposite for a clock that's at home. The fade steps say is how quickly the fade between the digits happens. So let's make that a ridiculously long fade, set it, and now you should see they take a long time to fade. Scroll steps is how quickly the scroll back happens. Let me reset that down to something reasonable. Um, so we can make a very quick scroll back by setting one. So it's almost not visible that it's doing a scroll back there. Something happens, but you can't really see what's going on. Or we can set it to be very long. Um, we'll set that back to the standard, which is four. One, two, three, four. Um, this is my favorite, uh, the backlighting. You can control the way the backlights work. So at the moment, I've got it set up to cycle through random colors. But you can also set fixed colors. So I'm going to set red to maximum. So it's going to be fully red, no green and no blue. And we can set that. And now you see that it's gone red in the background. So we can also do the same. Let's set it to, if you're in a green mood, we can make it completely green. Set. And now it's gone completely green. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to cycling. And all of these settings, you can set them to be fixed so they don't dim at night or um, so that they dim with the rest of the clock. So I'm going to set that back to what it should be. These no longer mean anything, but they don't get, they get ignored. Um, and I'm going to set a very fast cycle here. And now we should see that the colors change rapidly. So there we go. There's um, the Wi-Fi module configuration possibilities for this clock.